I'm sorry. It's my special pleasure to now introduce to you uh, Professor Luca Gamaitoni. He's from the University of Perugia. And his special subject uh, or speciality is noise. And uh, when I asked uh, uh, Professor Gamaitoni um, whether he is an experimentalist, uh, he said to me, uh, look, it's Feynman said, there are theoretical physicists and then there are physicists and he is a physicist. So, um, and it's a special pleasure. I just want to say that I uh, admired uh, 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 what Luca told me. Uh, one of the projects, I think it's even a startup company that uh, you are building is working with sensors uh, that get their energy uh, from the environment. So uh, for example, he has a sensor that uh, investigates or measures the vibrations of a bridge in order to see whether the bridge is about to collapse. And the energy it needs to send the data to somewhere is actually uh, coming from the vibrations themselves. So you can have intelligent solutions that really uh, kind of are self-sustaining and don't need energy from outside. And since I'm a big fan of cuckoo's clocks, uh, of mechanical systems, uh, where usually you only have to put in a little bit of, of work yourself, and you don't need batteries, this is uh, something along my, my line. So thank you very much. And um, uh, please put your hands together for uh, Professor Gallup. But before we go to your talk, uh, may I ask uh, Professor Ma to introduce uh, your bio. Hello again. Uh, so yeah, let me introduce Professor Luca Gamatoni, a director of the noise in the physical system laboratory at the Department of uh, University of uh, Peruga. Right. So by the way, I'm I'm disturbed by noise. So you're going to provide a solution for me. <laughs> okay. So Professor Luca Gamatoni is a professor of experimental physics at the University of Peruga in Italy and the director of noise in the physical system laboratory. He graduated at the University of Peruga uh, and obtained a PhD in physics from the University of Pisa in 1990. Uh, under the Lin Power, by the way, Pisa is the good, good place. Since then, he has developed a wide international experience with collaboration both in Europe, Japan, and USA. And in 2016, he has been awarded the Spectral Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for the observation of the gravitational wave, opening new horizons in astronomy and physics within the LIGO-Virgo consortium. He authored over 350 papers on top-level scientific journals and few books. He is also the author of 10 patents for industrial application. So let's welcome Professor Rupa Zanetoni. Thank you so much. After this introduction, whatever I can say will be not enough, <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm so glad to be here and uh, just relax. My talk, there will be much less mathematics. Hopefully it will be as interesting as uh, uh, my colleague's talk, but on a completely different topic. Well, first of all, I want to tell you something about the place where I come from. Uh, that's Italy, and Perugia is a town right in the middle of Italy. It's uh, geometrically between Florence and Rome. It's the capital of Umbria, which is the small region designed there. And uh, it has a border with uh, Tuscany, which is usually very famous. And um, Perugia is, a very, is the site of a very old university. It was founded in 1308, so it's more than 700 years old. And this is my group, um, the Noise and Physical Systems Laboratory. It's about 10 people. And if you want, you can find uh, further information of what we do on uh, our website, uh, which is www.nipslab.org. What we do in this lab? Well, we do a number of things, actually many different things, all more or less associated with the idea of fluctuations and noise. Uh, this is a list of European funded projects that we coordinated or participated in the last, uh, say, 10 to 15 years. And basically, we are interested in uh, um, energy transformation at very small scale, where small scale means that uh, the power 
is significantly below 10 milliwatt and volume is significantly below one cubic centimeter. But now <clears throat> let's come to the, the, the topic of the talk today. So the title is why it is difficult to find something if you do not know what you're looking for. This seems to be a joke, but actually it's a quite a common situation. Sometimes you have to find something, but you don't know exactly what to find. This is a condition that nowadays is becoming more and more popular with this big data approach. When we have so many data available and we do not know what to do with this data. This is one of the topic um, as, a, as um, uh, been mentioned, I have, also the founder of uh, a number of startups. One of these startups, uh, which is called Wise Power, work on the topic that uh, uh, Thomas mentioned before. And now we have accumulating a number of data, a lot of data from vibration, for example, building vibration. So people start, say, okay, what can we do with this data? What can we look into the, those data? Okay, so plenty of data everywhere. Um, the idea is that they must be worth or something. There is people who is also talking about uh, uh, the data uh, are the new oil, okay? So it, it's something which brings you uh, uh, wealth, value, if you know how to uh, exploit this data. So this is the big data scenario. And you have seen that in many of your, our universities, we have already started these uh, um, courses in big data analysis. And sometimes they are, of course, merged with artificial intelligence courts or with, uh, um, uh, say, machine learning uh, techniques. Now, I am old enough to say, to, I can say that we are actually assisting at a change of paradigm. Sometimes this activity on data is coming to uh, influence our understanding of the natural things. So physicists are the people among all the others that are more curious about natural things. And we want to understand the fundamental laws of nature. This is what they told me when I started to study physics. So let me give you what is the traditional or the Galileo paradigm on this. Well, let's look at this picture, okay? This is something that you can observe when you go out and you see this uh, beautiful person on a, on a swing and she's swinging. Now that more or less uh, what probably Galileo saw when he was thinking at the pendulum. There is a long road from this picture to the pendulum. What is this long road? Well, first of all, you have to decide what is the phenomenon that you want to describe? What are you looking at? Maybe you are simply interested in uh, monitoring the temperature of this woman, or you are interested in seeing how the, the hair moves or how the, the color of her skin change with time. So you have to decide what is the relevant quantity that you want to, to pick up. I'll show you an example afterwards in which this process is detailed. But what I mentioned, what I mean is that there is a long road to go from a phenomenon to a physical model. That's a physical model used by Galileo. I mean, the, the extreme complexity of the woman on the swing has become a single ball, actually a material point that moves on a circular um, trajectory, and you are interested in monitoring the angle of this uh, uh, ball, the angle that the vertical does when it moves around the vertical, possibly for small oscillation. So, I mean, can you understand how difficult or how complicated is the compression of the huge complexity of the phenomenon towards the model? So this is what physicists do. This is what we have been doing for many, many years. We have been observing natural phenomena and trying to guess models which are able to capture few aspects that we believe are relevant for the description of the phenomena. 
on doing this, of course, you lose a lot of information, of course. Uh, we do not know what color are the eyes of the girl or what is her temperature, but that, those are immaterial for us. We are fixed on measuring the angle, okay? So this is the Galileo approach. Now, what is the big data approach? Now, there is a different pa paradigm or uh, somebody claimed that this is a shift of the paradigm. Now, the approach is data mining. What is data mining? Well, it, clearly it's a mining activity. When you do a mining, you go inside a mine underground and you look for something. Maybe you know what you're looking for. Maybe you're looking for diamonds. Uh, I know that this is popular in, in this place. Or maybe you're looking for copper or, or iron or something different. But you simply go inside something and try to, to see what you can find. And maybe you find things that you don't know what they are and you bring them out. So that's the paradigm now that is uh, proposed to us. Uh, am I joking? No, actually there is people who takes this very seriously. This is a paper from uh, uh, Wired. And uh, it says, uh, the end of the theory, the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. So there is a clear uh, attempt to change the paradigm on how we do model, how we make model for explaining the natural things. Okay, so this is one, one thing. Um, th there is another thing I want to tell you. Uh, before, uh, Jan Ze has mentioned that I've been working on gravitational wave detection for a long time, and that's true. We got this beautiful prize. Uh, my colleagues and friends, like Barry Barish, got the Nobel Prize for this. So I've been working something like 25 years on building gravitational wave detectors. We, of course, were uh, very much into the noise aspect of the gravitational wave detectors. Uh, these are very sensitive instruments, and the noise is very important, of course. So th this was um, uh, this is a picture taken in Perugia. Uh, soon after, um, okay, 15 uh, uh, September 2014, it was the first observation of gravitational wave. Soon after, there was the Nobel Prize that was awarded to three persons. Among them, there was uh, Barry Barish, which was the head of the experimental collaboration, LIGO Virgo, which was a very large collaboration with about 1000 people involved. So after the Nobel Prize, I invited Berish to come to Perugia and to give a public lecture. At that time, I was the president of the foundation of the uh, Municipal Science Museum in Perugia. So we organized this kind of outreach event as you do very well also here. Berish came to, to my place we organized this public lecture was extremely popular. A lot of people, we were in a very big room, but we had to let people out because the, it was extremely popular. After the lecture, we went to dinner. And when we were at dinner, uh, we were chatting. Of course, I, I knew Barish uh, from a long time because I was part of the collaboration. I said, now, what are you going to do now? So Barish uh, was telling me, look, now we think that we are going to try something different in order to find uh, uh, information inside the gravitational waves. Just let me show you, these are the signal of a gravitational wave. This is what we measure uh, with the instrument. It's, this is a, a typical phenomenon of a coalescence of, for example, two black holes. So the two black holes come, come close and then they start rotating around each other until eventually they collapse. So there is a sort of explosion, they merge actually. And there is a new black hole. In, during this phenomena, this merging, a huge amount of energy is released in the form of gravitational waves. And these waves travel for, for million, million and million of kilometers and uh, many also uh, uh, million of years. So after some billions of years, you can actually observe the gravitational wave when they come close to you. So how is a gravitational wave detected? We have an idea from the theoretical uh, study of general relativity, how the signal should be, okay? So now you have the, the, the measurements from the, the interferometers for this, 
from this gravitational wave detector. And the measurement is a mass of noise, of course. It's a, it's a time series, usually, of the distance between two mirrors. And you're looking if inside this time series, there is some oscillation like those that you see there. This is a very hard uh, search. It takes time, it takes effort. It takes a lot of work to optimize your detector. But eventually, uh, we succeeded. So those are the wave uh, uh, forms that we were looking at for detecting gravitational wave, because we expected that the merging of two black holes could be a strong signal. Now, many of these signals have, have been observed since then, many in the last, uh, say, uh, eight years, many signals. There is a catalog that's published. You can go and check how many. And now Barry Berish was telling me, look, what we want to do now, we want to go back to the data that we have already analyzed to see if there is something else. Because we have been taking data for eight years, so we have plenty of data. And we want to see if there is something else inside. What else? He said, we do not know. We yet do not know. But now we're going to use artificial intelligence. We're going to use machine learning technology to see if inside those data, there is something that we do not know. A new form, a new waveform that we do not expect, a new kind of physics. Maybe there are other phenomena different from black hole uh, merging or, 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 or yeah, star explosion, maybe phenomena that we, don't, we do not even know. They generate a gravitational wave and we want to discover this new phenomena. So that was the dinner. <clears throat> and, uh, I, I was kind of perplexed. So I thought about this for a couple of weeks and then I wrote back to, to Barish uh, saying, look, I think that what you want to do is not possible. You're not gonna get any new information out of your activity. Uh, and there is a very good reason. And let me explain you this reason. So we started a conversation. I'm not sure that I convinced him, but certainly he was listening to me. Now I'm going, uh, I want to go to tell you why this is not a good approach. And there is no hope to find something unless you know what you are looking for. Okay, so this is a, a, a very, very statement. And um, so the idea of looking for something which we do not know if there is and exactly how it is, is not new actually. This idea was already around uh, uh, an, a number of years ago during uh, the beginning of so-called chaos theory or chaos studies. And uh, especially in around the 70s and the 80s of the last century. And the work of Dutchman uh, uh, Floris Takens and David Ruel was focused on this. At that time, it's, uh, the, the, the question was, is there any attractor strange attractor inside the data that I'm measuring. The data that I'm measuring are just random noise or they come from a dynamical system that is moving in a very complicated way because it's chaotic, but it's not random. There is a, a, a dynamical system behind. So that was the idea that we're uh, 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 looking for. And so there are a number of good reason that they developed. And if you want to look at this good reason, there is a nice paper by uh, uh, Professor Angelo Vulpiani here and uh, Haik Osni. It's called Forecasting in Light of Big Data and has been recently published. I want to give you, uh, these are mathematical uh, reasons, very, very strong and interesting mathematical reasons. I want to give you a flavor of this reason by mentioning a work from the literature. I don't know if you are familiar with the work of the great uh, uh, Argentinian writer, Jorge Luis Borges. Borges, it's a, a writer. It, now it's dead, but it's our contemporary. And he wrote many interesting novels. One of these novels is particularly interesting and it's called uh, The Library of Babel. Have you ever heard of it? Nobody? Good. Okay. I recommend 
everybody. You can go, you can stop this lecture, go out and go reading this book. This is the most important thing you have to do. Way more important than listening to my lecture, okay? This is a novel. It's, it's, it's a very short novel. You can read it in one hour easily, but it's very beautiful. And the reading of this novel will change your life. I can, I can assure you, your life before and after the reading will be different. There are not many texts like this, huh? okay? Maybe there are some texts from the, the traditional religions, of course, but not many texts in your experience will be like this. Before and after, you will be two different persons. So the novel is about a library. A library is a place where there are books, of course. So the library that Borges uh, dreamed about is a huge library. And this library, of course, contains books. But if you open one of these books, you do not find easily a readable text. You find simply a set of letters, actually all the 24 letters of the alphabet, plus some punctuation, but they are all mixed together. They are randomly disposed along the book. So the, the, the novel is very poetic. So I strongly recommend you to, to read it. You can read it in English. If you know Spanish, read it in Spanish because it's beautiful. So the idea is that the books in the library, they contain all the possible combination of letters. How many are these? They are a huge number. So if you take the 24 letters of the alphabet and you mix them together and you measure, count all the combination possible, this is a huge number. So, and you, then you collect all this combination into books. Every book is different from the other. There is no repetition, I can guarantee you. And you have a huge number of books, but still a finite number. Say like billions of billions of books, okay? But still a finite number. So in principle, a library like this can be built. In principle, this can be done, especially with our uh, uh, information and communication technology instrument nowadays. So the Library of Babel was a dream at Borges' time. I think the paper, was, the, the, the novel was written in the 40s of last century, almost 100 years ago. Now they, in principle, we can make it, okay? So the Library of Babel really looks like the big data paradise. Think for a moment, there must be a book somewhere that tells the story of your life. The story of your life since the day you were born, what, what you did, which school you went, and eventually how you will die. There must be a book like this, right? In principle, yes, of course, because it is, it is writable. This is a story that you can write. So if I take all the combination possible, there will be a book that tells the story, but not only one. There will be thousands, hundreds of thousand book in which there is only a small variation. For example, a word, which is different from the others, but the story is the same. And then there will be at the same time, a huge amount of books that tells a different story. Which one is the, the, the real story? Which one is true? That's crazy. I mean, if you think about it, this is like a, 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 a vertigo. You can get crazy thinking about this. So I strongly recommend you read this book and think about this because this is going to change your life, your perspective. Now, the Library of, of Babel contains all the possible information. So the problem now is just extracting this information and finding the information that is relevant to you. There is a book that tells uh, what is going to happen next week, how the stock market will perform next week. Certainly there is, because there are books on stock markets, of course. There are records on all stock markets events. So there's certainly a book in which the stock market of next week will be described. The point is to find it. Now, <clears throat> Let me 
give you an example that tells you why you will never be able to find the book that tells the story of your life. Let's look at this sentence. Okay, this sentence is in English. While the music goes, Alice and Bob exchange secure messages through their entangled spins. This is a sentence contained in one book, okay? I, I open a book and in the middle of a mess of letters, I found this sentence. Whoa, that's beautiful. Now, question is, what is the meaning? What is the meaning? Well, it depends, it depends. The two words, entangled spins, may indicate two very different things depending on whenever you interpret them using a 19th century English dictionary or a 20th century one. In the first case, the phrase would indicate the confidences that two lovers exchange, perhaps whispering mouth to hear, during a vast tour. That makes sense, right? That, that's what's happening. These two lovers dance. Maybe they are illicit lovers. Maybe they need to whisper something to each other while they are dancing, because maybe that's the only chance that they, are, they have to come together, close together. This is a possibility, right? But there is another possibility. If you use another dictionary, more recent one, in the second case, what sounds like while the music goes, Alice and Bob exchange safe messages through quantum cryptography. That's exactly what is reasonable, could go, right? Same sentence, two meanings. Which one is the true meaning? That's impossible to say. Because it is true that you have all the combination of letters and these are an infinite number. So you, are, you have a finite number of books, but the meanings that you can associate to each string of character, the number of meanings is not finite. It's infinite. There are infinite meanings for each string of character. That's the terrible news. You will never be able to find the book of your, of your life or, or the book of uh, uh, the stock market tomorrow, because for each string, there will be infinite number of meanings. The meanings are more, many more than the string of character, an infinite number more. Okay, let's move on. So, this is again Borgs. It's a it's a sentence from Borgs, very very poetic. But eventually, eventually, you should realize that the number of meanings that can be attributed to the text of those books is infinite, and therefore, this infinite amount of meanings cannot be contained inside the books. The guy who discovered these things is this uh, 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 guy. It's um, Jules Antoine Richard, and uh, this is called the Richard paradox. So the fact that to a finite string of character, you can assign an infinite number of meanings. And if you want, this is uh, one of the, the original works that uh, uh, eventually helped uh, uh, Gödel to formulate the, the in, in, in decision in indecidibility uh, paradox. Okay, so in our case, having a certain set of data available is equivalent to having the potential answer to an infinite number of physical problems. That's the problem that LIGO and Virgo will have. They have the data, but they do not have the answer, the, the questions. So the, the data are the answer to a possibly infinite number of questions. For every possible answer, there is an infinite number of perfectly compatible questions. What is the question that you are interested in? It's impossible to know the answer if the question is unknown to you. That's the sad truth. So there is no algorithm, no machine learning, no artificial intelligence 
no computing power that holds. However large it may be, it will not be able to find the answer to unknown questions. That's why it's impossible to find something if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, if you want to read more or, or, or listen again to this story, you will find this is on the, on the web available. Um, there is also a, a, a link, but if you go on medium.com and you put gamma tone in, you will find it. Now, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's try to move on. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, uh, uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Adams. That, that's a beautiful book. It, it's very funny. Not as important as Borges' novel, but if after reading Borges' novel, you're still alive and you have time, you can go and read this book. So at the end, you remember the people who have read the book, there is this... Uh, <laughs> right. But Douglas Adams, uh, it, it, it's a great in his own field, but certainly not as great as Borges, but you are right. <laughs> okay, so this, this uh, at the end, I mean, the story is they built a huge computer. In this uh, book, in this novel, they built a huge computer that has to find uh, the final answer to the question of the universe and everything else. And the, the computer computed for uh, many, many years at the, the end, the answer is 42. <laughs> so, okay, the answer is 42, but what is the question? Nobody knows. Question is lost and uh, it's completely useless. <laughs> okay, what has this to do with the work of physicists? Well, of course, it will be a, a little frustration for Barry Barish and my colleagues, but I think that there is something to teach us also about uh, uh, our work. So how do we build models of the universe, how do we build models of physical systems? Just let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, let's suppose that we are interested in building a dynamical model, meaning something that has to do with the motion. So uh, let's suppose that you have a, a bunch of stones or pebbles like this one, this is our system. And then we have a phenomenon. For example, we want to launch the, the stones uh, possibly in the water or something like that. So we have a, a system and a phenomenon. And uh, how do we describe this phenomenon? As I said before, just like Galileo did, we need to decide uh, what's worth, what, what is interesting for us. So we need to decide to start asking the questions. This is the niche, the, the, the start of our process. What are the questions that we want to, to ask? Meaning, what are the relevant features that we want to describe? in order to identify our phenomenon. Well, for example, we are interested in the motion of the stone. Now, we need to select at least one physical observable. What we want to measure, I would like to remind this to everybody, physics is about measuring things. No measure, no physics. I love my theoretic, theoretician colleagues, but still, of course, and they agree with me, no measure, no nature, no physics. So what do we want to measure? A physical observable, something that you can observe. And uh, well, we, we pick up the position of the center of mass of the stone. Well, I remind you that the stone, while it moves, if you look, if you observe your phenomena, the stone quite easily will also rotate. It has in, in principle at least six degrees of freedom if it's a rigid body. But we focus only on one, the position of a center of mass. So we reduce that to from six to three. And, uh, and then what we want to observe, we want to observe how this quantity change with time, what happened when the phenomenon goes with time. And what we observe, we observe that the motion is parabolic. So the trajectory is a parabola. This observation is not trivial at all. It took some time to, to come to this point, and it was Galileo Galilei who first discovered that the motion was a parabola. Why Galileo was interested in studying this motion? Because at that time, right, like exactly like now, if you want to survive, if you want to do science, you need to find a job. You need to find somebody who's paying your salary. 
At that time, the salary was paid by the powerful people. And they were not interested in throwing stones. They were interested in using cannons. So the idea, if I have a cannon and I point the cannon in that direction and I, I fire my cannon, where do the, the project, the, the, the bullet go? Okay. So this, this is what Galileo was doing, studying uh, the motion of uh, uh, bullets out of uh, cannons. And then we can ask a number of questions. So now we have a parabola. How does the parabola change if we, for example, change the initial velocity or, or change the angle? And uh, so based on these experiments, we can do what Galileo did. Galileo found the equation of the parabola. So in a parabola, this is a two dimension motion. You have Y and X. And if you go and look at the trajectory, this is exactly a parabola like this one. Galileo Galilei, discorsi e dimostrazioni matematiche intorno a due nuove scienze attenenti alla meccanica e ai movimenti locali, 1638. Now, uh, that's, the, that's hard to translate because it is, is old Italian. So it's speeches and mathematical demonstration around two new sciences uh, dealing with mechanics and local movement. Okay. Are we happy with this? Do you want something else? Is everything that we want to know about this phenomenon? Uh, well, we would like to know how X and Y change with time. That's just the trajectory. But how long does it take to go through this trajectory, for example? And how this time depends on the initial speed? So the last point goes beyond Galileo. Galileo was not able to solve this problem. Um, maybe today we could use some clever algorithm so machine learning could do that for us. Could find, so the time equation for X and Y, starting from the data, from the observation. This, this could, in principle, can be done. Luckily enough, we, we, at that time, we didn't have uh, um, uh, machine learning, so we couldn't use it. But now, if you have the, the, the time equation, and you ask question, what happened if I change the initial velocity, if I change the condition? One, I'm not sure that machine learning can give you this answer, but at that time, we were lucky because there was uh, um, um, uh, this guy, Isaac Newton, which came with the solution of this problem, meaning uh, let's suppose that there is some wind, there is some friction in the air, speed changes, initial angle changes, and so out of the uh, um, curiosity of Sir Isaac Newton, we have now the equation of the dynamics. This is way more useful than the, the equation of the parabola because this says whatever is the force F. So if the force it changes, it's not just the gravity, but there is some friction, for example, or, or, or yes, or the gravity changes, you are in the moon instead of being in, in, on earth. How does it change? Okay, and so this is what uh, uh, Newton uh, gave us. Thank you, Sir Newton. This was an example, just throwing a, a stone. This is how we make our models. I, I wanna give you just a very simple uh, uh, additional example. Sorry, I think I made a mistake. No, what is this? Okay, okay, now. Uh, let's look at some more complicated system, a dynamical system, which is not just throwing a stone. Um, let's look at the case, for example, of a Brownian motion. Brownian motion, you have a small particle. Uh, initially, it was a pollen grain. You put this particle in the water and the particle moves in a very complicated way. This is very well known since uh, uh, the 1800 and even before. But Robert Brown was the guy who did all the, the observation experiments. And then we now you want to build a model for this phenomena. This is a different phenomena for throwing a stone. Not so easy, but uh, uh, nevertheless, as a physicist, we did that. 
and uh, uh, Albert Einstein was, was the guy who first found the, the description of this phenomenon, but I prefer, that was 1905. 1908, three years uh, after, Paul Langevin came with a, to me, better explanation, or at least easier explanation. It's the Langevin equation, has been mentioned before by, by Eric. I'm not going to go into details here, but basically you use the Newton model and you change the force. The force now is not just a deterministic force or constant force like the gravity, but you introduce a stochastic force, something that changed randomly with time. That, that was a very brave uh, assumption by Paul Langevin. Um, okay, just like uh, a, a, a Paul Langevin, he was known for many things. Among them, he was the lover of Marie Curie. After uh, uh, Pierre Curie's death, Marie Curie uh, established a relationship with uh, Pierre Langevin, and that was not very well seen at the time. People were very strict. Okay, so the beauty of Langevin approach stays in the identification of two distinct forces that are, they come from the same uh, physical source, which is the water. These forces are the, the drag, the friction drag, and uh, the, the heat from the water molecule. Um, I want to give you another example, uh, slightly more in detail, but this is uh, not motion of something, uh, just to explain why physicists are so powerful in making models. For example, the epidemics, uh, something that we uh, had to deal with uh, uh, Sadly, in the last uh, two years and a half, um, this is a model made by two scientists uh, about 100 years ago, um, Kermak and McKendrick. These were two Scottish scientists. And they came out with this model to explain how an epidemics develop inside a population. And the model is very simple. The population is divided into three compartments. So there are the, the people who are healthy, like hopefully we are here, and they are called susceptibles because they can become infected, but they are not infected. Then there is a, a group of people who are the infected, okay, the red one, and then they are the removed, so people that overcome the infection or died under the infection, but certainly they do not belong to this. So all the population can be divided into three groups. The model is very simple, as you can see. And then they came with the equation on how do this quantity change with time? Because we know the change. There is a probability, beta, that from being healthy, you become infected. And then there is another probability that after you are infected, you become removed, meaning you uh, heal, you, you, you are uh, uh, healthy again, maybe uh, Im immuno immunized uh, compared to the virus, or unfortunately you die. So you can write down the equation. These are simple differential uh, uh, equation. The dot uh, means uh, differentiation uh, over time. So you have three, uh, a set of three equations, and you have a, 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 a condition, of course, that the total number of people is constant. So this is a simple model, okay? It does not uh, um, take into account the fact that new people are born. So this is a very, is the easiest model actually that exists for this, but it, it works pretty well. In fact, if you look at the evolution in time, you see the typical curve of every epidemic, every epidemic wave at this shape. Um, okay, and of course, the shape depends on the probability to go from one uh, container to the other, one department to the other, and that's beta. In uh, uh, our model, beta is usually a, a come from two factors that we call C. C is the promiscuity. How many people you frequent? How many people you meet? Uh, what are your attitude? If you go out a lot or if you stay at home, then C, and then there is T, 
that depends on the virus. How transmissible is the virus? If the, the virus is very, very um, aggressive, as they say, the virus, the virus is a small machine. It's a, it's a fraction of DNA is not, has no will, has no personality, is not even alive. It's just a, a small mechanical machine. Okay, now, of course, you can act on C through the lockdowns. You want to change people attitude. You, you uh, forbid the people to meet other people, or you, can occur on T uh, through protection devices. You have the mask, so the virus has more difficulty to, to attack. Okay, um, but if you look at the experimental data, these are observational data through the world, you see that there is a lot of fluctuation inside. So we thought that maybe we could use our knowledge on noise to study this model. And so what we did, I'm not going into detail here, We uh, we what we did, we added uh, a fluctuating terms to the description of this coefficient, okay? And that was interesting because there was a long debate in Italy if, uh, um, say, time-limited event could be important or not for the epidemics. For example, a festival, for example, a concert. Let's suppose that we go to a concert. The concert lasts only for two hours, but all the people come together for two hours what it will be the impact of this event on the following days? This is an interesting question, okay? So we try to study this question uh, using stochastic uh, dynamics to, to simulate and to model this. And it was interesting because it depends uh, uh, on the feature, the, the time feature of the stochastic noise, uh, meaning what is the correlation time? So what is the quality of the contact that you have? If the contact is just a, 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 an instant contact, or in contact that come that comes with some, you for example, you go out to dinner or you shake and uh, 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 and that's it. So the, the the consequences for the epidemics are uh, associated with this uh, characteristic with feature, and we showed that uh, depending on the feature of the noise, there will be very much different uh, uh, consequences from this uh, time-limited event. Okay, I want to finish this uh, uh, presentation, just leaving you the, the last message. Uh, the models uh, are not only useful to, to describe, uh, of course, physics, what exists, but they are time-traveling machine. The models that we make are useful to predict the future, but also to post-dict the past. And uh, just to give you uh, an example, for example, we can say in Florence next August, the sun will rise at 536 and will set at uh, 1854. How do we know it? Well, the, the talk from Professor Vulpiani yesterday showed us that uh, our model are actually able to predict the motion of the, the earth, the sun and the moon. And that's enough to, to uh, answer this question. And uh, also I said, post -dict. we know, for example, that on in Paris on July 14, 1789, a quite remarkable day, I say, the sun rose at 4, 10 and set at 1958. So the, 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 our model work in both directions. Um, however, the time is associated with change according to this perspective. This was a, a notion known since a long time and it was part of Aristotle's uh, grasp on the topic of motion and, and time. So let's look, uh, let's suppose that we have a particle that sits on a horizontal table. And in classical mechanics, uh, we can describe the evolution in time of this particle. Clearly, we, how, do, how well do we know the position of a particle? We can measure it. But even with the most sophisticated measurement system like the gravitational wave detectors, we know the particles only with a certain amount of uncertainty. That's the error, measurement error. If the force is zero, the particle will follow this kind of uh, uh, equation. So the uncertainty in the, the position of the particle eventually will grow with time. But if we start with the velocity that is zero, or small compared to zero, that will go nowhere, okay? So in principle, the particle can stay uh, put in the position where we left. 
in quantum mechanics, it's slightly different because in quantum mechanics, still we can describe the time evolution of the positional particle, but there is a, a, a complication. The complication comes from uh, the uh, indetermination principle. So you cannot uh, have at this very same time velocity zero and uh, position fluctuation zero. So the uncertainty on your velocity and the uncertainty on your position cannot be zero at the same time. What does it mean? It means that if you put a particle on a table, according to quantum mechanics, the particle will not stay put. If the particle is put, according to Aristotle, time does not exist. No motion, no time. In quantum mechanics, the particle will not stay put. Immobility is forbidden by quantum mechanics. And so time is unavoidable. Time is a necessary feature in quantum mechanics. It's not a necessary feature in classical mechanics. Principle, you can forget about time. Not in quantum mechanics, time is inherently present into our description of the universe. And there is also another feature, which is interesting. How does the ball move? Our particle, how will move according to quantum mechanics? Well, more or less like this. Well, it's not a trajectory quantum mechanically, but certainly the uncertainty will grow with time and will grow according to the fluctuations. So the position will be subjected to a quantum fluctuations. So time, quantum fluctuation. Where do the fluctuations come from? So the analogy between the thermal fluctuation of a Brownian motion and the quantum fluctuation in the position of a particle has attracted attention, of course, in the last uh, uh, 50 years in the physics community. I want to mention these people who have been looking into this problem, the role of uh, quantum fluctuations and how do they uh, fit into the quantum uh, scheme. Um, and I think this is interesting. So at the basis of this approach, there is the idea that the presence of fluctuations lurks in the most minute structure of space-time. And I think this is something worth thinking about. It. Okay, two messages to take home. Two scientific knowledge arises from the world of scientists that build models, meaning a struggle to find meaningful question to be answered via experiments. Second, randomness, noise, fluctuations are essential ingredients in this model because far from being mean disturbances, mere disturbances and approximation, for what we presently know, they belong to the very fabric of the space-time. Okay, so if you want to get more information, these two books uh, uh, deal with, largely with the topic that I mentioned here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Um And now we have uh, time for a few questions. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of finding the features in the residual gravitational wave data, the LIGO Virgo thing, um, I think there are people like having some particular signal in mind and just, uh, just trying to data mining the rest of the things. Can you comment on this? Sure, sure. Uh, of course. Or did they find anything interesting? No, that, that's exactly what uh, should be done. It should be, um, should guess some possible mechanism to generate uh, uh, gravitational wave. For example, um, tiny black holes. Well, how small can be a black hole? But somebody thinks that, that there are uh, primordial tiny black holes that survived uh, the evolution and yeah. they, they can be as small as few microns yeah. in diameter. Uh, and sometimes the people think that they can be also um, attracted by large masses and can one, one legend, I don't know how, how good it is because I'm not an expert on that, but they, there is people that says that there are uh, tiny black holes trapped inside the earth, for example. 
and they keep oscillating around the gravitational uh, center of the, the the planet i don't know if this is true uh, maybe i don't know so and they, these people think that they might emit a, a, a weak gravitational signal that can in principle be detected so there are studies on that estimate maybe they are lacking a few orders of magnitude i don't know but that that's an approach so you imagine you you figure a possible mechanism and then you go looking in the data that's something that the, the community of science actually require the gravitational wave detection started more than 100 years ago but it was plugged by many many false alarm people that said okay we have observed that but the community, in order to see this, the community, in order to award the Nobel Prize, they wanted a detection at the same time in two very instruments, very far away from each other. That's the, where the two LIGO detectors. And now we have three detectors with LIGO and Virgo, and then there will be a four detector with Kagra in Japan. So the number of detectors, because that's what you need in order to be sure that this is a real signal, it's not just an artifact. Yes, there's a question over there. Thanks, um, thanks for interesting talk. Um, as a layman, I'm just uh, coming into like observational case. Um, so you are talk on the on the big data. There is a data, large amount of data, but finding the solution is uh, in the timeless manner is most important as well. Um, I mean, if I if I have a problem, I need to find a solution immediate. You know, in terms of the time. So in that concept. I'm thinking that the probability of distribution and the filtering of the data is most important. Can you comment on that? Well, that that's, hits the topic of data analysis, of course. And uh, this is a topic that has been around for, for many, many years. It is the very basic of statistics. Uh, uh, look, I, I, I want to be, I'm sober about uh, machine learning. I'm not against the, this technique. Besides, I mean, I've been, teaching uh, uh, computer science for some time. And um, my idea is the following. Uh, um, machine learning presently are very, very powerful technique, but it's a technique, a technique among others that has been developed uh, um, on the shoulder of giants who studied the statistical data analysis. It's not the end of it. We have not seen the end of it. The question could be, there will be machines able to figure out the model, the physical model, machines able to do what uh, uh, Galileo did, or machines able to do what Newton did. There will be, not now, not these machines. We need way more. Why am I sure that there will be machine like that in artificial, real artificial intelligence? Because we are, we are these machines. We are machines. We have been built and now we are going to build other machines by the moment that we can do that other machine eventually will be able to do that that's my point okay i think this is this is a very good uh, point to stop if there are no more urgent questions um thank you very much for this uh talk.